Okay, so we're now moving on to our next session. The session is on the next generation of old vine vineyards in Lodi. So how do we turn today's 25 year old vines into tomorrow's 100 year old vineyards, 100 year old vineyards? Rising redevelopment costs plus economic, climatic and viticultural challenges require Lodi wine growers to build resilience in their farms to sustain and thrive for years to come. This session is being presented by Stuart Spencer, who is the executive director of the Lodi Wine Grape Commission. The, this is a trade association representing 750 wine growers farming 90,000 acres of wine grapes as well as 85 wineries in Lodi, California. Stuart has been with the commission since 1999, and he was responsible for spearheading Lodi's Save the Old campaign, committed to elevating Lodi's historic vineyards. In addition, Stuart is the winemaker at Santa Mont Winery, which was founded by his parents in 1981. He has extensive experience growing, crafting, and promoting exceptional wines from Lodi's, Lodi's old wine vineyards. Thank you, Stuart, for joining us, and I hand over to you. All right, happy to be here. Let me see if I can share my screen. And all right, hopefully everybody can see that. So to get started, um, let me just give you a little overview of the Lodi region of California. Um, it is an historic farming region in California, uh, dating back to the 1850s when people first started coming to California. Um, our AVA was officially established in 1986. We have about 36,000 hectares under vine production, of which 90% is grown by independent growers who are selling their grapes to um, wineries, both small, medium, and very large. Um, within Lodi, there are seven distinct sub-AVAs, and um, we have about 700 plus uh, independent growers that are very committed to the region, sustainability, and learning. Um, there are 136 unique varieties being grown in the region today. It's an incredibly diverse region. We are the largest producer of the premium varieties um, and commercial varieties of Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Merlot, and many others. Um, we are probably most known for our Zinfandel and our Old Vine Zinfandel. And um, it was, uh, we were the Zinfandel capital of the world for many years and, um, and uh, have some vineyards still dating back to the 1800s and a lot from the early 1900s own rooted vines in the sandy soils of Lodi. Um, there today, there's about 80 wineries in the region. We have some very small boutique operations. The majority are small and low uh, boutique and some very large wine companies that are also based in the area. And we represent about 20% of California's um, wine grapes are grown here. Um, going to talk a little bit about the current situation and, and how this leads to, um, you know, the discussion of old vines. Um, you know, we in California are dealing with very poor market conditions right now. Uh, buyer concentration, both at the winery level, uh, at the distributor level, and at the retailer level, supermarket level across the world, uh, the emergence of these global alcohol companies, um, is really uh, narrowing the pathways to market for many producers. Uh, we have a flood of cheap bulk imports coming in. Uh, millions of gallons from our largest grape buyers are also the largest importers of cheap wine that are undercutting all California growers. In the U.S., we have a flat to shrinking wine market right now, and uh, there's a lot of stuff in the news about that, which we won't get into, but the reality is is, is we're not sure what the normalized wine market's going to look like yet and where it's going to find its footing. Um, we've had overplanning across California and I think the globe in general, and we are dealing with that in a, a global oversupply situation that is affecting all growers, I think, across the world as we read the news today and every day about crisis distillations in this country and farmers protesting in this country and, and the challenges that we are all facing in a global connected wine market. Um, 
we are also dealing with the rising farming costs that are leading to unsustainable conditions. We've had a rapid rise in costs here in California over the last probably five to 10 years that is really squeezed, squeezing the margins of all growers at every uh, point. And uh, the farmer, unfortunately, is at the end of the food chain. And across agriculture here in the U.S., as we've seen supermarket prices rise for all foods, the farmer is not getting that money and they are struggling to make ends meet. One of the other challenges we've got right now is aging vineyards. We have many thousands of hectares of vineyards that were planted during the boom years, uh, going back to the early to mid 90s when red wine consumption took off in the US. We had a lot of vineyards and we saw a lot of vineyard expansion. Those vineyards now are, are pretty approaching you know, 25 to 30 years of age. And they are seeing a lot of challenges with reduced yields and disease challenges in a market that is paying less for them than they were 20 years ago. Couple that with the high replanting costs of running anywhere from 60 to 75,000 a hectare to replant a vineyard. Um, it doesn't pencil, it doesn't make sense, economic sense to pull out a vineyard and replant it unless you are growing those grapes for a specific wine program that is willing to pay at a price that will justify those replanting costs. The irony of all of this is that, um, you know, the rec recognition and reputation of our region is at an all-time high. Uh, there are more and better wines coming from the, the region with each, each vintage um, and uh, it makes it easier for us to promote Lodi. Uh, we have a long ways to go, but the dominance of the global players and the buyer concentration is dragging down the whole region uh, economically and the whole state of California economically. So where do we go from here? How do we turn today's 25-year-old vines into tomorrow's 100-year-old vineyards? This is not just an old vine question. We have plenty of old vine vineyards, and many of them are coming out, unfortunately, right now. But it's also uh, an economic health question. You know, how do we as a community continue to thrive? How do we take these 25 and 30 year old vineyards and make them economically viable for the next 25, 50, maybe perhaps 75 years for the families that own them? And so this is these are the questions that we are asking ourselves today as a region and uh, and how we're going to address this, I think, is is through a much uh, an Appalachian-wide approach. It is a regional approach that is not going to, um, you know, be solved individually. Um, we uh, we can't do this uh, by ourselves. We're going to rise and fall together, and we need to work as a community to solve these problems. And um, we need to recognize that we're all part of a bigger system and uh, your neighbor's problems are your problems, whether it's dealing with disease and vineyard pests or um, the economic profitability of the whole region, that working together, we are going to be more successful. Um, I'd also, you know, I've broken it down into three categories here and uh, you have the two major ones, I think, which are economic health and vineyard health. You have to have economic health in order to have vineyard health and sustainability. And beyond all that, you need to have happy farmers. And what I mean by happy farmers, you, you have to have people that are uh, engaged with what they're doing. They're hopeful for what is to come and they're willing to invest for the next generation. And uh, old vine vineyards and, and a region like Lodi and many other wine regions requires a generational outlook. And so um, this is where happy farmers are a critical piece of it. It's the people part that really makes this work. I also wanted to touch upon, I think there were some great seminars this morning and, and there uh, was a lot of discussion around sustainability and I think um, I want to highlight one of the growing gaps we are seeing in the sustainability world. We have a sustainability program that really began as a grassroots program back in 1992 um, and has grown into the Lodi Rules for Sustainable Wine Growing, a vineyard certification program that has upwards of 72,000 acres certified in it across California, Washington State, and Israel. Um, but the growing gap in sustainability is... is is the farmer himself. We spend a lot of time talking about our vineyard workers. We spend a lot of time talking about environmental conditions and social conditions, 
But in order to be sustainable, you have to be profitable. And when 90% of your vineyards in our region are selling grapes to large international global wine companies, um, they have to be paid at a rate that makes sense. And there seems to be, you know, in a large segments of the market, they want sustainability. The supermarkets want sustainability. They all want to claim these things. But in many cases, they're just checking off the, pay the boxes and, and not doing the real work. And so as we move forward, this is an area that I think really needs to be addressed both here in California and globally. And so as I look further into this, this, this is what happens if we're not successful. This is a bulldozed Old Vine Zinfandel vineyard next to one of our global wine companies' facilities. And uh, this vineyard was probably 50 to 60 years of age. Grapes were not harvested last year. Um, and uh, this past winter, they were pushed over and um, the ground sits bare at the moment. I'm not certain what will be happening there. But the first part of this that I wanna address is the economic health. And um, I think, as I said a minute ago, profitability equals sustainability. You can't be sustainable unless you're profitable. We are not going to subsidize our way to sustainability. We're not going to provide incentives to become sustainable. The market has to lend itself to some form of profitability so that the farmers can invest in all these practices that make sense. To do this requires a generational outlook. And too often there's a short-term outlook of short-term profits that drive decision-making and not long-term long -term outlook. We are fortunate here in that I've got a, a group of generational farming families that have been here oftentimes in the fourth, fifth, sixth generation that really care about the place and the community and, and want to invest so that their kids are, have an opportunity and want to come back to the farm. We've been very successful with this, but the current challenges in the market are really making it difficult. For economic health, we also, it's gonna need a community-wide approach. We are stronger together than apart. And um, this is in all, asset, all aspects of what we're doing from uh, marketing and promotion to vineyard health and, and everything in between. Um, and we've been in our organization, it was established in 1991 for this very approach. It was to link our community together, provide a sense of community and common purpose. And, and we've made a lot of headwinds and a lot of progress in that, but there's a lot of stuff in, in our way. The other part of this, the economic health, is place matters. And, and I think, you know, vineyard and regional marketing is critically important. Um, we need to make Lodi mean something. There is a um, gravitational pull towards brands and just branded marketing uh, separate from vineyard and place. And this is particularly, uh, we're at the crossroads of this where we had some of our vineyards in the premium sector that are able to take advantage of vineyard and place-based marketing, but others that are getting continually being drawn into the commodity side of the wine and grape business where place doesn't matter. And it's unfortunate when you walk into our supermarkets right here in Lodi and you'll see endile displays of wine that, you know, the same brand may have three different countries listed on, on the different SKUs, or you'll have the same Cabernet Sauvignon and one bottle is from Chile, one bottle is from California, and then the Chardonnay is from Australia. So it, it, this, you know, is really aggravating as a farmer right here in Lodi to see this and uh, our global alcohol wine companies are driving this and uh, the supermarkets and distributors are helping with it. I think the other important part that we're stressing with our, our family farms, the diversification really does matter. It's not just a matter of diversifying grape varieties, but it's probably most likely going to be diversifying uh, your farming operation. In some cases, it's gonna lead to multiple crops, um, multiple um, activities, um, and creating additional on-farm income. And, uh, and that can be done in many different ways. One of those is through agritourism and creating agritourism opportunities. The family that I'm showing right here, they also uh, started a goat cheese uh, farm and creamery in addition to their 40 acre vineyard and small uh, winery that they have. And, and 
that is helping them survive and bring their two girls into the business. Um, adaptability is critical too. We need to be able to adapt to the changes that are coming and uh and this is a you know from everything from the vineyard side of things to the market side of things and be able to do it in a quick fashion community and culture matters and and i talked a little bit about our community-wide approach but the culture you create within your community matters a, a willingness to um, work together towards things um, and a recognition um a recognition that success breeds success. And if you create this culture within your, your farming community and within your, your wine community, you can achieve a lot more together. And so we spend a lot of time kind of working and building a culture that uh, fosters this. I think the other part of this that we're, we need to be discussing for the economic health is farm scale too. Uh, we in, in California and to a great extent have added acres and tried to spread out costs in order to be more efficient. Um, and the larger you get, the less you're able to take care of the day-to-day -day details in a way that really moves things forward. And so we need to find a manageable farm scale that allows you to diversify your business and not be too much at risk and too tied into certain channels of market. I think one of the most important things for helping any one region is going to be a competent and effective local organization. We have um, you know, large institutions across the industry that do help, but they don't help at the local level the way that is needed connecting the face-to-face -face time with the farmers and the vintners that really can move a region forward. And it's critically important that we have these, um, these uh, organizations in place like ours and others um, that can move a region forward and address the challenges that they are facing, whether they're um, economic or uh, in the vineyard. So I'm going to touch a little on now the vineyard health part of this, and, and these are all very high level overview uh, of what we're doing here, but I think it's critically important that if we are going to take a 25 year old vineyard and turn it into a 50 or 100 year old vineyard, it has to be a healthy vineyard. And for us, you know, we, we take a very holistic ecosystem approach to it. Our Lodi Rules program that developed as a grassroots program has 150 different standards that addresses everything from uh, irrigation uniformity and distribution to environmental health to an ecosystem management plan to pesticide use to uh, the human side of it. And, and it's this whole approach that I think is going to help our, our um our vineyards be healthier. Uh, diversification is going to be critical too. With the disease and pest pressures we are experiencing, having different crops and rotating crops through the area is going to be critical to creating natural barriers that build health and resilience. And that's at the key of what we're trying to do. We are finding that the more a vine is stressed, um, from environmental factors, whether it be climate or uh, yield factors or economic factors, the more likely disease is to spread, the more likely you're to see reduced yields and challenges. Within the disease management category, um, we have two major areas that we are having to deal with here. The first is, is, is viruses and, and leaf roll three in particular is a real challenge here in, in, in the Lodi region. Um, and this became a real problem back about 10 to 15 years ago when we went through a minor planting broom and a lot of infected vines were dropped into the region um, from the nurseries. Simultaneously, we had the growing infestation of a invasive species called vine mealybug, which is a very effective vector of leaf roll three. Um, this created a significant challenge for the area. We've also seen the combination of leaf roll three, uh, other viruses, vitaviruses, and rootstock leading to sudden vine collapse. And so that is when the vine, a happy, healthy looking vine in the middle of the growing season all of a sudden dies. And, uh, and there are other environmental health stressors that are probably uh, triggering that death. The other thing we're dealing with is trunk diseases and how are we going to manage trunk disease? So, and when we see that reducing yields in a vineyard over time, there are over 130 known trunk diseases. We generally think and talk about Eutypha, but there are many others and um, there are lots of 
different practices, but you have to be on top of it um, and continuing continually roguing out vines uh, and replanting new vines or training up new vines um, and dealing with uh, varieties that are more susceptible to these and, and how you manage them. Site and vineyard design is going to matter, matter a lot too. Um, when we did have that expansion of acres, a lot of vineyards went in on um, uh, what virgin ground. They never had vineyards on it before, so there's less soil pest borne pressures. Um, but not every site is suitable for um, an old vineyard, and we do know that. Um, we are also having to adapt our vineyard design canopy management to the changing climate so that, that we can get through these heat spells like we have seen recently at harvest time. Uh, as we just went through um, some very high temperatures in the first week of October in California. I think one of the other important things we are learning too is that um, is the two, importance of two-way communication between the farmer and the academic and regulatory community and uh, the industry of vendors and suppliers. We need to all be at the table in two-way communication and too much of, of extension has been kind of a top-down approach. This is one of the other challenges we're seeing with the, the sustainability across the world is it's coming from the top and pushing down on the agricultural communities. It works much better when it grows from the ground up. And there's a lot of wisdom in the people that have been farming their land for 150 years. And when you connect them with the right academics and scientists that allows for a two-way communication, they can really create meaningful progress. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute um, in one particular example. Um, this is also highlights the importance of the local organization in facilitating this two-way communication. Um, and, and we've got a great team here at the Lodi Wine Grape Commission that helps facilitate this. So one of the programs I'm going to talk about that, that kind of encompasses a lot of these things is, is how we're managing uh, vineyard viruses and, uh, and where we move from here. And, and one of the biggest challenges is we need real-time, non-destructive, affordable, early detection of viruses that is accurate. And... Uh, one of the other big challenges is the symptoms of leaf roll virus, as you see on the screen here, uh, are apparent in red grape varieties, but not in white and not in rootstocks. And if we are going to be successful, we need to clean up our nursery material. We need to clean up our vineyard supply chain so that we are not continually infecting vineyards with, uh, with viruses that are easily spread through vine mealybug and have devastating economic and profitability and wine quality consequences. So we are taking a novel approach here and, and our success is going to come from dogs. And uh, we are at the end of a uh, research project to prove the economic viability of utilizing dogs for detection of vine mealybug and viruses. And uh, these four dogs here, two of them have been trained to detect vine mealybugs and two of them have been trained to detect um, a leaf roll flea virus in a vineyard. And, um, and just to show you uh, some of the results. So when you look at, um, when you look at uh, commercial laboratories for testing, um, for testing of leaf roll three virus, uh, the uh, sensitivity of the labs was 92.9%. That means they are accurate 92.9% of the times and specific, Specificity is when they are um, determining if a vine does not have leaf roll three. So when you send them a, a, a no negative test, are they able to determine that it's a negative or is it coming up positive sometimes? So that being able to determine this detection is critical to cleaning up our whole uh, supply chain. And so you can see from the, the, the results with the dogs here that um, uh, they are performing at a higher level than we are getting out of uh, the labs. And this is going to be critically important because they can carry a lot, uh, cover a lot higher amount of ground at a much more efficient price and cost. And, uh, and they only get better the more they are trained. And so our strategy at the beginning, and this is once again how we 
in Lodi look to support the entire wine growing community is to begin at the nursery level in their, their rootstock blocks um, in places that you cannot visually detect viruses. And instead of having to test millions and millions of vines, if you can run dogs through and identify those vines that potentially that have a testing that would test positive for, for virus and those vines that may have a mealybug infestation. We have find oftentimes mealybugs in the wax seal on the, where the graft union is of vines coming out of nurseries. And um, we are also uh, know that if once you have mealybugs in a vineyard, sometimes it takes several years before you even detect the infestation. And by that point, it's really late. Um, and so this is just one example of how we are working together as a community to address this. This project, we were fortunate to get funded through the Department of Pesticide Regulation, and uh, but it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Bolton, who has managed this project from the beginning and, and saw it come off the ground. This has incredible potential to help our entire industry and hopefully help us address this these challenges we are dealing with. If we want to turn our 25 year old vines into 50 year old or 100 year old vineyards, we are going to need to keep them healthy. It's gonna require all the things that have been talked about today um, from sustainability on the sustainability side in vineyard health and soil health. And it's gonna include the management practices from um, uh, managing your viruses and trunk diseases, as well as the economic health is critical. None of this happens if the farmer cannot uh, turn a profit and continue to invest in his vineyard and his operation. And we need the cooperation, you know, uh, of retailers and distributors and, and the large wine companies, honestly, to make this happen. And, uh, and if we are successful, we will continue to see that today's 25 year old vineyards will become 1500 year old vineyards and continue to produce and, and make even better wine down the road that will attract consumers and help grow our industry be successful. That's all I have today, so. Stuart, thank you. That was such a comprehensive and integrated presentation. I think that it was really masterful in how you related the economic sustainability with the social sustainability, cultural, and also, of course, this really detailed applied information on the nitty gritty of making these wine regions and your wine region really truly sustainable in a in a really 360 degree approach and i also think it was extremely serendipitous that just after we'd heard about this very controlled little niche of how there might be some tolerance in a controlled way for the role of um, viruses or re reframing certain viruses when it comes to diversity, you of course reminded us that as um, as Sebastian said, a healthy vineyard is a long-lived vineyard. I also think that the the dog slide was just the most wholesome slide of the <laughs> of the whole conference. <laughs> They're very good dogs. And I uh I I, I really appreciated your transparency and the sense of urgency um, in, in the real life challenges that your farmers are make uh, uh, and your wine growers are uh, facing. I wanted to ask you, you said that the most important aspect is to be able to harness the knowledge of farmers, if you like, grassroots upwards into academics and policy makers. What initiatives or models have you seen that can do this effectively? And what would you like, is there, any, is, there any, is there anything you would like to be able to implement or try that you haven't yet in terms of harnessing this ground up approach? Well, I think um, I think our Lodi Rules Program is a is a classic example of a, from the ground up. You know, it started just with neighborhood tailgate meetings out in the vineyards, introducing practices, you know, such as cover cropping and uh, beneficial insects and it's grown to a program that has 150 standards that addresses all sorts of things and it's led it's led to meaningful improvements in sustainability across the whole system and i think one of the challenges in the wine world is we spend a lot of time talking about 
a very small segment of the market. But if we really want to create, you know, a better world, you know, we need to be addressing the the, the whole market too, and in, in the practices that are going there. And so, I think, you know, our work, you know, on the ground, connecting the farmers with the scientists, and and the scientists have to learn to appreciate the wisdom that comes from the farmers because they're the ones implementing this on a day to day basis. In California, the challenge we have is that um, you know there's a lot of money going to things but there's not a lot of accountability that it's actually making a difference and so i think you know we would love to see a more um, two-way conversations between our regulatory community and our um, our um, you know farmer community and and have them actually listen and uh, and and we're not there, and and it's creating real challenge in the for the economics of of farming and agriculture. Thank you.